thank you, uh, Chandrakhan, uh, from the Bliss team at the uh, in in Bangalore. Uh, I am Satyajit Mayer, the center director at the National Center for Biological Sciences, uh, a center of TIFR, uh, located in Bangalore. <clears throat> so I just thought I'd give uh, you know take a couple of minutes to give a overview of the COVID Gyan effort that uh, we have been engaged in now since the, almost since the pandemic began. And as you all know that the COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented uh, event in the history of this uh, planet. Uh, you know, there have been a few uh, pandemics before, but this is you know, also one of those extraordinary times. Um, and we have a, a number of challenges ahead uh, the biggest challenge we thought uh, was going to be one of information. And, um, and therefore, uh, the, the, and a torrent of information has been generated in uh, this effort and around this effort. And so we thought as a multi-institutional and a, um, a multilingual science communication initiative, which we call covid Gyan, would be an important contribution that uh, some of the public funded scientific institutions of this country could make. Um, and so, uh, you know, as a, a collective, the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research uh, and all its centers, the, um, especially the uh, International Center for Theoretical Science in Bangalore, who hosts the COVID Gyan, uh, the Indian Institute of Science, uh, and the Tata Memorial uh, uh, Center. Uh, of which today we are most fortunate to have uh, Dr. C.S. Pramesh, the director, with us. Uh, our other prominent partners include uh, Vigyan Prasar, India Bioscience, as I mentioned, the Bangalore Life Science Cluster, who's hosting this uh, activity, the webinar, uh, and, <coughs> the, um, and, our, and its allied institutions uh, in STEM and CCAM. Uh, an outcome of this initiative is, of course, uh, the COVID Gyan website, uh, which is something that you could you should visit and for information, uh, filtered information that is being filtered through some of the best scientists uh, in in the country, uh, and that's at uh, covidgyan.in. Uh, the COVID Gyan webinar, uh, on the other hand, are um, are seminars like the one that you're going about to listen from people who have made huge contributions and are hugely engaged uh, in this effort. And they bring a knowledge from their knowledge from the front lines of, of what is going on in the different uh, verticals that, are, that go on in addressing and tackling this uh, global pandemic. Uh, the uh, host uh, for the day, uh, the moderator of the panel, is a colleague of mine at, in Bangalore, uh, Dr. Arjun Guha, who himself uh, is somebody who studies how the lung uh, organ itself develops. He's, uh, he studies the, uh, how the uh, organ of the lung is put together and how it is um, in fact uh, uh, you know, affected by, uh, by insult. And he is uh, somebody who has deep knowledge of what kinds of insults the COVID-19 epidemic has been uh, able to create on, on the lung. So with, uh, without any further ado, I welcome Dr. Pramesh and Arjun um, to introduce him first and all of you listeners uh, to this uh, uh, COVID Yarn webinar. Over to you, Arjun. Uh, thanks, Jitu. Uh, welcome one and all to this uh, webcam session. Uh, my name is Arjun, as uh, Jitu just pointed out. Uh, I'm at the Institute for Stem Cell Science and Regenerative Medicine in Bangalore. I'd uh, like to begin by introducing our very distinguished speaker this uh, afternoon, Dr. C.S. Pramesh. Uh, Dr. Pramesh wears many hats. He's a clinician, a researcher, and an administrator, and has distinguished himself as a leader in all these three capacities. Um, just briefly, his clinical interests include the management of esophageal and lung cancers and minimally invasive surgical approaches to treating these disorders. He is currently professor and head of thoracic surgery at the Tata Memorial Center in Mumbai. Dr. Pramesh has contributed more than 200 peer-reviewed journal articles, 
abstracts, book chapters on various topics, including thoracic oncology, clinical research methods, translational research, and of course, cancer policy. As an administrator, he is currently the director of the Tata Memorial Hospital and the convener for the National Cancer Grid, which is a large network of 217 cancer centers in India. And in addition to all of this, he also serves on the advisory board of several national and international research organizations and granting agencies. In his talk today, Dr. Pramesh will discuss with us how COVID-19 related biomedical research is impacting treatment in the clinic. The title of his talk is very provocative. Has COVID-19 research set back evidence-based medicine? So without further ado, Dr. Pramesh. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Arjun. And uh, thank you, Jitu, Sandhya, and Pavitra for the invitation to speak on um, COVID-19. So as uh, uh, Jitu mentioned, we are going through pretty unprecedented times as far as uh, the pandemic is concerned. I don't think a few months back, any of us would have imagined the situation that we currently are in. So uh, while there are several aspects of the pandemic which uh, uh, strike us as unique, to me, what has uh, been particularly striking has been uh, the, the casualty, a collateral casualty of which has been uh, the, the, the dependence on evidence-based uh, medicine. And uh, I'll just go over that in the next half an hour or so, and I'm happy to take any questions. I have no disclosures with the content of this talk. So just like we've had an unprecedented pandemic, we've also had a tsunami of uh, uh, journal articles on the COVID pandemic. So editors across the world are receiving almost twice as many manuscripts for submission as they have uh, in previous years. So which means that there's a huge amount of activity and enthusiasm to uh, study COVID-19. And these are all related to COVID-19. So I just did a PubMed search this morning and uh, within a few months of uh, the pandemic, we've had over 30,000 citations uh, which have uh, come on. Not all of them are distinguished. Many of them, many of you would have heard of uh, these very famous retractions uh, based on the Sergi Steer papers. This was uh, a paper which they published in the New England Journal of Medicine and uh, uh, almost simultaneously another paper published in the Lancet which was also retracted. And uh, primarily because uh, the, uh, the authors were unable to, to show that the raw data existed and to this moment, this remains a mystery. So not all of what's been published in the last few years, a few uh, weeks have been, uh, have done the medical community a lot of good. So I'll start with how is research during a pandemic different? So uh, if you go through what we've uh, had over several, over the past few years, the first is that researchers are finding it challenging to create protocols and regulatory approvals, primarily because of the pandemic itself, the challenges of not being able to meet face-to-face. -face. And while uh, virtual meetings have uh, exponentially increased, there are some challenges to uh, getting regulatory approvals, for example, on time to, uh, to, to start studies timely. Uh, importantly, uh, communication seems to be key. It's not just that uh, we do good research, uh, the research needs to be communicated uh, equally well, considering that uh, panic amongst the general public is at an all-time high. And any form of science, whether it be true science or pseudoscience, gets embraced without the filter of uh, peer review or, or allowing sensational uh, reporting to go through what should otherwise be a more uh, sober uh, reporting of science. Uh, Researchers have found several reasons, I'll call them excuses, to dilute the quality of research. And uh, the, the main reason touted is that the desperation of the situation uh, is such that we need to uh, look at every single bit of data and maybe interpret them. And I would say the risk of over-interpreting them is far higher and actually come up with some, uh, some in, uh, conclusions which are not strictly valid. So I'll use a few examples to uh, illustrate my point and I'll start with diagnostic tests. I'm very aware of the fact that not many, uh, uh, there are uh, a few scientists also in the audience. So just uh, harping only on therapy would not be uh, interesting. So I'll start with diagnostic tests and the, uh, the conundrum that antibody testing has uh, created. First, 
there is lack of clarity about where these uh, tests should be used. Should it be used as a diagnostic test? And currently, I think there is sufficient evidence to, to demonstrate that using it as a substitute for, say, an RT-PCR or a CBNAT is not a great idea. And it's clearly not the uh, indication for which it is meant. Which brings us to the other two areas, which probably there might be an indication, which is to look at zero prevalence. So when you're looking at mass population-based uh, uh, screening, zero prevalence uh, studies, uh, there might be a role for antibody testing because it not only uh, picks up some of the, the uh, ongoing infection, especially towards the latter half of the uh, infection itself, but also uh, to some extent lets us know whether an individual has been infected in the past as well. But where it has gained a lot of traction has been to use it as an immunity test. And I'll come to that uh, in a minute when I uh, describe the problems that we are currently facing with antibody testing. Importantly, it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's key to know that we need to validate these tests. And this is where I think there, has been, uh, there have been a lot of shortcuts that have been taken. We all know that any diagnostic test uh, prior to approval needs to be validated, but under the uh, guise of the urgency of the situation, the validation processes followed have not been uh, of a standard which previous tests have gone through. And I'll explain why. Many of these have used very small sample sizes. And when you get a report as saying 100% accurate or 100% sensitive, it sounds pretty impressive. But what's important to realize here is that many of these, and these are real life situations, this is one antibody kit which was validated with uh, 49 samples out of a total of uh, uh, 65 which were uh, tested. And based on results from 49 samples, it was concluded that, what, that this was a 100% uh, 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 correlation. What is equally disturbing is that you might have large but probably inappropriate sample sizes. And as you can see from the same study, the same validation of the kit which I was mentioning about, when you hear a 449 patient study, you get even more impressed because it's a reasonable number to do a validation study. But it's key to remember here that only 49 of those were, uh, were positive. Similarly, for another kit, uh, which looked at over a thousand uh, uh, samples, what it, it, it actually evaluated 1,070 samples out of which close to 1,000 were pre-COVID uh, outbreak era when you had the negative controls to do so. And the other validation which is required very often is that of other respiratory illnesses like other coronaviruses or uh, influenza virus and so on. And th these were just 73 patients when which this was uh, sampled. And even when these are done, these samples are pretty cleverly selected in the sense that the positives are usually those who have had severe illness and recovered, ensuring that they are much more likely to have uh, antibody titers in a, in, a, in a level which will be detected. And on the other hand, the negative controls are usually healthy blood donors where the likelihood of finding a false negative is uh, false positive is extremely low. Similarly, not testing people with other respiratory infections, and that's clearly the most important cohort if you're likely to use this as a, as a uh, uh, test. In this example, again, amongst all the other viruses that were tested, the cytomegalovirus test which was used in this was just in one individual. So you're basing your 100% record on one individual testing positive, uh, but not showing up the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 antibodies uh, against it, with, with just one uh, patient with cytomegalovirus. So clearly this kind of minimum sampling for uh, cross-contamination is, is, is just not acceptable when you're looking at validating a test. I said I'd describe the, the issue of antibodies and immunity, and this has created a lot of excitement in various circles. The, 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 the basis for this being that usually after viral infection, IgG antibodies develop, and these are usually considered as surrogates for neutralizing antibodies, which by itself is, a, is, a, is an assumption. But even granted that assumption, the, the theory that was touted was that mass screening of individuals with these rapid antibody tests would therefore identify those who have these IgG antibodies and we consider them being immune. And if, these are, if they are considered immune, it means that neither can they contract an infection again, nor can they pass on an active infection to somebody else. Thereby, it has a lot of implication for the economy because if you have a, say, 
30 to 40 percent uh, of the population developing antibodies this uh, uh, allowing them to be part of normal life would open up the economy substantially but the problems have been that as we've gone through these antibody tests and we're seeing this more and more commonly in some of the recent studies these antibodies are seen in a very small proportion of patients they are not uh, as widespread as we thought it would be even in uh, uh, in in countries where they have they've had massive infections so for example in spain it was under 10 percent sweden which actually had a no lockdown policy uh, just uh, limiting their strategy to allow to to expecting their population to distance physically uh, had uh, an antibody uh, positive antibody rate of just 10 percent so though there are body, uh, pockets of uh, many of these uh, countries where the antibody levels have been up to 30%, the average has always been less than 10%. And this has been pretty disappointing for those who felt that herd immunity would contribute to, at least the antibody-based immunity would contribute to controlling the pandemic. Secondly, antibody-mediated immunity does not uh, happen in all those who are infected. Even in those who pr have had proven SARS-CoV-2 uh, with RT-PCR, there's a proportion of them, albeit small, it's just 10%. Most of them seem to develop some antibodies at least for some time. 10% of uh, patients with proven RT-PCR positive COVID uh, uh, infection do not mount an antibody-mediated immunity, which means that, that uh, assuming that uh, those who developed COVID uh, positive RT-PCR and have recovered from it are immune is probably not true in all cases. But probably the biggest disappointment has been recent data, again, small studies, which show that uh, IgG antibodies are not very long lasting. Unlike SARS and MERS, which uh, uh, persist for years beyond uh, when the infection occurred, these disappear in just two to three months in many of these patients. So these, this is still preliminary data coming in from Wuhan. Uh, this is pretty sobering because for those who are depending on herd immunity based on antibodies to, uh, to get over the pandemic, this doesn't seem to be a very promising uh, strategy. There is some good news though, uh, something which has not been studied as often as uh, antibody-based immunity, which is T-cell-based immunity, uh, seems much more active than anticipated earlier. And here, there doesn't seem to be a dose-response relationship. Even in patients who have not had a, uh, a severe infection, it seems to uh, be, uh, uh, they seem to mount a T cell based immunity, which is very unlike the antibody based immunity, where the severity of the infection is uh, directly proportional to your likelihood of uh, developing IgG antibodies. I'll move on to treatment, and uh, when, it, when you do a, a PubMed search on COVID-19 and treatment, the results are equally impressive, close to 10,000 citations as of this morning. And uh, we've had several discussions on, uh, especially when it comes to uh, treatment uh, innovations during a pandemic, and we've had uh, uh, researchers arguing, especially uh, those who are non-clinical, uh, non-clinical uh, or uh, physician uh, researchers, who, are, who argue that the pandemic is no time to do large randomized trials and we should probably look at natural experiments as a surrogate for them. There was a recent uh, uh, editorial in the New York Times which seemed to suggest that uh, uh, coronavirus researchers should learn from economists who use natural experiments far more frequently than is done in biomedical research. And I'll just come to why that is not a great idea in a minute. I'll use this example. It's been used very often by by champions of evidence-based medicine. Uh, hormone replacement therapy was very commonly used to prevent uh, coronary artery disease. And it was widely practiced in the late part of uh, the last century, going right up to, the, uh, up to 2000. This was based on very sound logic and an understanding of physiology. Uh, for those of you who are not physicians, uh, the incidence of heart attacks uh, in premenopausal women is much lower than that uh, of, of a similar aged uh, male. And it is also much lower than that of a postmenopausal woman. So which brings you to a, a, a probable hypothesis that there is something in the hormonal milieu of the premenopausal woman which protects them from heart attacks. And there was strong observational data to support it. There were by then in the US, hundreds of thousands of women who were receiving hormone replacement therapy for their postmenopausal symptoms. And many of these studies, uh, practically all of these studies, of these observational studies showed that they reduced the, the possibility of uh, uh, myocardial infarction or, or, uh, uh, or heart attacks. And in addition, 
there were some unexpected benefits which were seen as well, which led uh, Women's Health America to uh, come out with a health flash, which says that estrogen not only takes care of uh, your heart attacks and your postmenopausal symptoms, but it also unexpectedly results in a low incidence of Alzheimer's disease. And as Alzheimer's, as you know, is a very difficult disease to treat. And these are some of the observational studies uh, prior to 2000 which looked at, uh, looked at exactly this issue on whether hormone replacement therapy improves, uh, uh, reduces the chances of heart attacks. So the first study, which shows a relative risk of 0.34, which means that it reduces cardiovascular death in patients who take hormone replacement therapy by nearly 66%, 66% relative risk reduction by uh, taking hormone replacement therapy. Other studies which show that uh, it prolongs survival in women who already have coronary artery disease, Again, 20% lower mortality amongst estrogen users in the postmenopausal community and in the postmenopausal setting. Uh, another study which shows that uh, uh, when they looked at the lumen diameter of uh, the blood, blood vessels supplying the heart, there was decreased loss of lumen diameter in those who are taking uh, uh, hormone replacement therapy. Again, relative risk 0.64, where uh, after a first myocardial infarction, the likelihood of you are getting another infarction is reduced by almost 36%. Uh, those who've undergone a cardiac bypass, a 62% reduction in uh, uh, risk or an improved survival. Another 62% improvement in uh, survival in those who had angioplasties done. So as you can see, plenty of observational data, very, very compelling, which show that hormone replacement therapy uh, reduces the chances of uh, getting uh, a heart attack. Till somebody actually had the uh, the 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 uh, temerity to do a randomized trial of hormone replacement therapy for secondary prevention of uh, heart attacks in postmenopausal women. This was a fairly large study. It was randomized, placebo controlled, and double blind. Very high level of evidence. Uh, close to 3,000 women uh, in 20 centers with coronary artery disease randomized to either uh, a placebo or a hormone replacement therapy. Followed up for a reasonable period, more than four years which showed virtually no difference in cardiovascular outcomes with the hazard ratio of 0.99, which means that virtually there's really no effect of hormone replacement therapy, as, can, as you can see in this uh, Kaplan-Meier uh, uh, curve, virtually no difference whether you took hormone replacement therapy or not. And this was substantiated by uh, further studies, the Women's Health Initiative study, which showed that not only did it not uh, reduce it, it actually had an increased risk of developing coronary artery disease, increased risk of stroke, increased risk of pulmonary embolism, and an increased risk of all kinds of cardiovascular disease. So not only was it not helping, but it was actually causing harm. And flashback to that uh, health flash that you heard, saw about dementia. Out of the 4,500-odd women in the Women's Health Initiative study, who were initially, uh, at the time of enrollment, free of dementia, 61 of them developed dementia during the course of the study. The, almost double the women in the estrogen arm, um, uh, I mean, double the patients on the, uh, with dementia and the were in the estrogen arm compared to uh, uh, 34 percent, I mean, uh, 21 uh, patients in the placebo arm. Again, showing that not only was it not helping patients with, uh, with, uh, with uh, not only with the coronary artery disease, but it was causing harm with the dementia as well. And I'm not just picking up an example just to prove my point. There are any number of examples which, based on observational studies in the 1980s, had a complete reversal of what we believed in the 80s by uh, in the next two decades. Class 1 antiarrhythmia arrhythmics for uh, after myocardial infarction was thought to save lives in the 80s. We know now that it causes death. Estrogen is already something that we've discussed. Inotropes for congestive heart failure thought to help. Now we know that increases mortality. Vitamin E and vitamin C for secondary prevention. Again, we know that there's, uh, we thought it was a 50% reduction. Now we know that it's either no effect or actually a harm. So these are not just uh, solitary examples. There are any number of examples where you know that historical controls or, or observational studies do not really give us the truth. Which brings us to uh, this, uh, the plethora of studies that we've had in the past few years, in the few weeks with uh, COVID-19. One of the first studies which came out with uh, a breakthrough uh, uh, publication was with the compassionate use of remdesivir for patients with severe COVID-19. And I'll just ask you to focus on this title for a minute, which I'll come to uh, in one of the subsequent slides. So what it showed was that there was considerable improvement in those uh, individuals who were given uh, remdesivir 
uh, with, with many of them recovering. And mind you, these are patients with uh, severe COVID-19. So any form of recovery is some, something that would excite a lot of clinicians. So this study seems to show that in uh, quite a few of these patients, there was actually a, a, a fairly substantial improvement in outcomes. Based on this, the authors concluded that in this cohort of patients hospitalized with severe COVID-19, who were treated with compassionate use remdesivir, clinical improvement was observed in uh, 36 of 53 patients, which is uh, almost two thirds, which is not something that you would normally expect in patients with severe uh, COVID-19. But let's look at this study a little more carefully. So this didn't come out in the final publication, but it was part of the, the, the uh, supplementary material that the authors had in the journal. So let's look at this, 61 patients who uh, received the drug, eight of them excluded, remaining 53 patients, of which 40 patients received at least 10 days, 13 patients stopped before the 10-day course, but all 53 patients were included in the, in the analysis. Looks good to start with. But my first question would be, how were these 61 selected? So by the time uh, Gilead, the company which launched the study, uh, uh, started this ob observational study, uh, they were receiving thousands of requests from panicking patients within the US to want to be uh, given compassionate use uh, remdesivir. So how were these 61 patients selected out of thousands of patients? And why were these 61 patients selected over the others? So which raises questions as to whether there was a serious selection bias. There are even physicians who knew of patients who had initially refused to be given compassionate remdesivir because they were considered too sick. And when the patient improved, they were then subsequently taken on to the trial. So clearly raises questions about the propriety of uh, and the way these 61 patients were selected. In a situation where the United States was seeing thousands of patients every day, they preferred to do a single arm study with no controls uh, to compare with. And the easiest way for any drug or any intervention in medicine to be proven to be effective is to have either a substandard control or even better, no control. And this is the approach that the, the, the researchers took for this study. Interesting to know what happened to the seven patients who were excluded. So there were eight patients who were excluded and out of which seven had no post day one clinical data and one had an erroneous remdesivir start, which is acceptable. But what is interesting is that the authors at no point make any mention about what the, uh, what, what the outcomes were for the seven who, uh, where which there was no data. Did they all die? In which case the results of the study are, are majorly skewed. Did they all get recovered? In which case it's better. We still don't know. Even to this date, we don't know what happened to those patients. They finally ended up with a, with a sample size of 53 patients. And as I said, this was at a time when thousands of uh, Americans uh, developed COVID-19. So why did they decide to stop at 53? How was the sample size decided? Was it just an arbitrary number that they picked up? Nothing is clear in the original paper as well. But most importantly to me, why was a primary endpoint not pre-specified? When you're starting a study, it's extremely important that a primary endpoint is pre-specified, failing which you have the option of cherry picking what results you want to highlight as part of your study. And this is typically 101 clinical trials or clinical studies, which the, the researchers didn't uh, follow. So plenty of questions for which uh, there are still no answers. And I asked you to pay some attention to the title. With a, for a 53 patient study, which we just described, there were 56 authors. And in a 53 patient study, which had 56 authors, the draft of the manuscript was prepared by a writer employed by the pharmaceutical company. So what exactly were these authors or the author exactly were these researchers doing? Thankfully, a randomized trial uh, resulted after this uh, uh, observational study, but by then uh, sales of remdesivir had skyrocketed and the so-called compassionate use became the norm rather than the exception. We now have a randomized trial which looked at uh, uh, COVID-19 and it's interesting to see what the results are. Fortunately, the results of this study paralleled that of the previous study. Remdesivir was superior to placebo and uh, it, it came down to, uh, uh, to a clearance of viral load, a quicker clearance of viral load, and thereby hopefully translating into a shorter hospital stay. These were overall results. These were on patients not receiving oxygen, again showing superior results with uh, remdesivir in patients receiving oxygen showing remdesivir. But what is extremely important here is that these are not the patients who were studied in the original study. 
as you might recall from my description of the original compassionate use, those were patients who were severely uh, ill. And in that study, the results of that observational study was that it is beneficial and improves outcomes in patients with severe COVID-19. So what happened to the severe COVID-19 in the randomized trial? Virtually no difference. There was no benefit with remdesivir in patients who uh, were mechanically ventilated or required ECMO, which translates into the more severely ill patients. So if we had stopped with that observational study, compelling though it might have been, and not gone ahead with the randomized trial, we would have been left with treating hundreds of patients being ventilated with remdesivir and not looking at other alternative options for treatment of these patients and thereby causing substantial harm and resulting in a lot of economic loss. I kept the best part for last, the hydroxychloroquine saga. And uh, the, the entire story started with this, uh, th this study, which came out of France, Didier Raoul and his group from uh, uh, Marseille, who published this study of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin as a treatment of COVID-19. Uh, and this was again, similar to the compassionate use remdesivir study, uh, a single arm uh, observational study. This was actually a, a, a two-armed comparative study, but it was not a randomized uh, trial. So let's look at this study, because this was the study which actually created a lot of excitement in, in uh, medical circles about the usefulness of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. They started off with a planned sample size of 48 patients. Uh, they planned to recruit 24 in the HCQ and 24 in the control arm. So normally, even a novice researcher however flawed the rest of the study might be, however small the sample size might be, if you decide to have two patients in two arms and them equal, you would try to randomize. It at least reduces some of the other biases that you would otherwise have, though with small sample sizes, it may not. They ended up with enrolling 42 patients, 26 uh, on HCQ and 16 control. So they pretty much uh, selected uh, the physician selected which patient would get HCQ and which patient would get a control, which is probably standard of care. They mentioned in the paper that six HCQ patients were lost to follow up and therefore excluded from subsequent analysis. So, and they finally presented the data from 20 HCQ and 16 controls in the, in the final paper. Out of these uh, 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 36 patients, uh, roughly one sixth of them were totally asymptomatic 61% had uh, mild symptoms or purely upper respiratory symptoms, and 22 patients had low respiratory symptoms. And of these uh, uh, 36 patients, six of the HCQ patients also received azithromycin, and this is the basis of the rest of their results. So the curve that you see here, the percentage of patients with RT-PCR positive, the curve that you see here in black is the control which means that it took them much longer and fewer of them actually cleared their virus and they were not treated with any uh, drug, neither HCQ nor azithromycin. The blue uh, curve is the one which was the hydroxychloroquine arm. It shows that compared to getting no hydroxychloroquine, they cleared the virus faster. But lo and behold, with, uh, with uh, uh, azithromycin combined with hydroxychloroquine, mind you, this is based on just six patients' data, they seem to clear it even faster and virtually all of them cleared the virus within five days. And therefore they concluded that uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin as a combination should be the new standard of care. Now let's look at the patients that uh, were lost to follow up. So as I mentioned, out of the 26 patients, six of the patients in the HCQ arm were lost to follow up. And when you look back at uh, to see why they were not included in the analysis, three of them, were actually shifted to an ICU after they were started on hydroxychloroquine, which means that they got worse on the drug than they were before. One of them actually died. And this is besides the three who were shifted to the ICU. We don't know what happened to the three who were shifted to the ICU. Another one left the hospital without completing treatment. We don't know why the patient did not uh, complete the treatment. Was it unacceptable side effects, whatever. And we also know that one of them stopped treatment because of nausea and continued to be RT-PCR uh, positive. And these were the six patients who were very conveniently excluded from the data analysis. And again, major conflicts of interest, three of the lead authors were, uh, one of them was actually the editor-in-chief of the journal in which it was published, and the other two were, were uh, on the editorial board of the Journal of Antimicrobial Agents. 
And subsequent to uh, an uproar over uh, the, the, the veracity of this data, the, the way these six patients were excluded, as well as the fact that they were, uh, there were serious conflicts of interest with the editorial board, the journal was forced to, to, uh, to release, uh, to give out a release, which said that they, they have concerns regarding the article published in the journal, and they believe that the article does not meet the society's expected standard. Uh, especially related to the lack of better explanation of inclusion criteria and triage of patients to ensure patient safety. They stopped short of retraction, uh, but this is a pretty strong statement coming from uh, a journal which published something from their own chief editor. Unfortunately, uh, in a few days, the Lancet also published a major paper which uh, looked again at the Surgisphere uh, data, which is actually uh, close to 100,000 patients who were, uh, whose data was curated out of uh, electronic medical records of hospitals from several countries, and which uh, showed in the paper that uh, not only did hydroxychloroquine not help patients with COVID-19, it actually caused uh, uh, excess harm, and therefore it should not be pursued. So this created quite a stir in medical circles because never before had such a large data set been uh, accrued or uh, collected in such a short time, and uh, a lot of uh, downstream effects resulted. One very unfortunate part of that uh, publication in the Lancet uh, was the was the fact that, that the randomized trial uh, of uh, hydroxychloroquine as part of the solidarity trial in the w, uh, which, the, which the World Health Organization was conducting was paused for some time, and subsequently, within a few days, uh, the Lancet paper was retracted similar to the NEJM paper, primarily because the, the, the researchers were unable to supply the database on which these conclusions were drawn. So as much as some of the poorly conducted pro-HCQ studies uh, damage signs, so did some of the uh, anti-HCQ studies uh, damage signs purely by the, the kind of data collection and the over-interpretation of results that they did. As I mentioned before, uh, messaging is important. Uh, by now, the damage had already been done based on um, several uh, leaders, political and otherwise. Uh, hydroxychloroquine was being used rampantly across uh, the world, which resulted in a severe shortage of hydroxychloroquine for those who required it the most. And uh, uh, finally, by the time the recovery trial results came in on hydroxychloroquine, so I'll, I'll come to the recovery trial in a bit, but recovery was a very large trial conducted in the UK, which evaluated several treatment options for COVID-19, one of which was HCQ. And in early June, based on an early monitoring of the data, they concluded that there was no beneficial effect of hydroxychloroquine. And virtually, as you can see, the mortality was identical in patients who received hydroxychloroquine versus uh, usual care. And subsequent to this, the World Health, the WHO, which had uh, post retraction or actually even pre retraction of the paper looked at the Lancet data more carefully and restarted the trial have now uh, stopped the trial again and currently the recovery trial data and the solidarity data are now getting pulled to come into to get into a bigger uh, data set but at least after this you would hope that the HCQ story uh, would end and there would be no further studies but again just last week we had this uh, uh, preprint coming in from the Henry Ford Institute in uh, the US, again, with a large number of uh, authors, which looked at retrospective data at their own organization, which showed that the mortality in uh, HCQ was almost doubled, that it was, was half of what was seen in those who did not receive uh, HCQ. But again, this study was severely flawed. As you can see, the median age in, the, in those who didn't receive HCQ was 71 compared to 53 in HCQ. And in, in COVID-19, the one thing that stands out is the remarkable uh, uh, the, the, the impact of elderly age on outcomes. There is no other risk factor which predicts uh, poorer outcomes as much as advancing age, not even comorbidities or anything else. And with this, such a grossly flawed uh, comparison, uh, the authors concluded that HCQ had promise. And this was after the recovery trial data came in, which showed that it was useless. And go on to the uh, other parts of the Henry Ford study, more severe infections seen in those who did not receive HCQ. Uh, and uh, again, almost half the patients who uh, received steroids, where half the patients, uh, 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 almost half the number of, uh, the proportion of patients in the 
no HCQ arm received steroids as compared to those in the HCQ arm. And this will become relevant as we discuss other aspects of the recovery trial. I don't even want to go into this drug. Uh, I know this created a splash a couple of weeks back in uh, India when Glenmark uh, launched uh, Saviprabir. It was then seen to be a magic remedy for those with mild disease. Uh, the, the advantage being that it's an oral tablet. Unfortunately, this has not even completed uh, the planned 150 patient study that it was supposed to do in India prior to its launch. This was an accelerated approval which was given and unfortunately uh, got uh, into the limelight for all the wrong reasons. But I'm sure there are several others who are actually treating uh, patients with Habipravir with virtually no data to support it. So a lot of this seems dismal and gloom. So was it all bad? So was all the COVID-19 research terrible and did it actually should, has it spelt the death knell of evidence-based medicine? And that was precisely the reason I chose this as a topic. And fortunately, the answer is no. So this is a study that I will use to illustrate exactly what I say. This was the recovery trial which came out of the uh, UK. And I'll just describe, I'll just take a few minutes to describe the study. This was a not a pharmaceutical industry driven study. This was investigated, initiated, individually randomized. It was open labeled, which is probably the only criticism you could see, uh, take of it. It was not blinded. But given the fact that they had to quickly recruit and uh, did not have time to get placebos for the multiple arms that they were running, it is unlikely that you'll be able to do a placebo controlled blinded study on this. But it had an adaptive platform which lent itself to multiple arms and multiple stages. So as I mentioned, it had multiple treatment arms. Uh, dexamethasone was one of those arms. Uh, it was done in 176 uh, hospitals under the National Health Service of the United States, which clearly demonstrates the strength that they have in launching large studies like this. It was supported by, again, by a, by a national organization, the National Institute of Health Research uh, Clinical Trials Network, Clinical Research Network, and the sponsor was the University of Oxford. So clearly academicians involved in the design and conduct of the study. 11,000 plus patients recruited in 81 days. This is something which was unprecedented. And, and as much as we've had bad effects of the pandemic, I think demonstration of the fact that you can quickly recruit into large pragmatic trials in a very short time has been one of the plus points. Out of these 2,000 plus patients on the DEXA arm, you had 4,300 patients on the standard care arm. Follow-up information was complete for 95% of the patients and overall mortality was significantly reduced in the dexamethasone arm uh, and it was predominantly in moderately and severely ill patients. So you had an extremely inexpensive drug being used and repurposed in a different indication and showing a, a, a dramatic response in outcomes. And when you look at it, in all participants, there is a reduction in mortality with uh, dexamethasone compared to usual care. In those who are mildly unwell, it did not have any effect. The, the, the difference that you see here is not statistically significant. And the right way of interpreting this is that there was no difference uh, in outcomes between those who received oxygen, in, in between those who received dexamethasone or not in patients who did not require oxygen. So these are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic patients. But to me, the most exciting part of the study were the ones who are moderately ill, where they received only oxygen, where they required only oxygen, which is the vast majority of these patients. And here it clearly shows that there was a 20% reduction in mortality, which is a hard endpoint uh, with dexamethasone as compared to usual care. There was an even bigger benefit in those who required mechanical ventilation, a 35% relative risk reduction with, uh, with dexamethasone compared to uh, usual care when it came to patients with uh, invasive mechanical ventilation. So why do I like this study so much and why was this so impactful? First, it was a large pragmatic trial. So while the DEXA uh, stopped at 11,000 patients, the study continues to recruit in other arms. So there are currently over 12,000 patients in 176 hospitals. And why do I keep stressing this 176 hospitals? The fact that it was done in so many places means that the results are generalizable and reliable. So this is not a small uh, randomized trial, which is typically conducted by pharma in a few hundred patients where who are carefully selected Olympic patients treated by Olympic, athletes, Olympic physicians in Olympic hospitals. These were general routine district general hospitals in the UK. They started recruiting in nine days after, after uh, study approval. And most importantly to me, one out of every six patients in the UK with COVID-19 who was hospitalized was recruited into the trial. So typically in even academic centers, less than 5% of patients get onto randomized trials. And this was a single study which recruited 13% 
of all of UK's COVID-19 hospitalized patients. So clearly demonstrating that the eligibility criteria were very broad, they were not restrictive, and the external validity, which means how generalizable are these results in the general population is extremely high. And clearly the, the, the last statement shows the, the commitment that the government had towards uh, this trial. And they went, sent out a letter to all the NHS hospitals which participated in the study, ending with use of treatments outside of a trial where trial participation is possible is a wasted opportunity to create information that will benefit others. And if you see the hundreds of thousands of patients with COVID-19 being treated with random treatment regimens the world over, I can't uh, feel dismayed at the lost opportunities in each of them. In recovery, we've come out with two additional uh, uh, important endpoints which have already been uh, shared as press releases. Not only did it show that DEXA helped, it also showed that lopinavir ritonavir did not improve outcomes. This is one of the other arms that was being studied that has now been subsequently dropped. It has also uh, shown that, uh, that uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine does not improve outcomes as I'd shown in the previous press release. So two important questions already answered. The third, which was the positive result with dexamethasone. And this is the beauty of having multiple arms to study. It still continues to recruit patients on uh, three other arms, the azithromycin, the tocilizumab, and the convalescent plasma arm. So how did the whole system work? It worked because there was a simple design. It did not have fancy uh, uh, endpoints to look at. It looked at a very hard endpoint of mortality. The multi-arm, multi-stage design provides a lot of flexibility in dropping arms, adding new arms, and this is something that's unique to the to the MRC way of uh, functional uh, functioning. The enrollment and data collection was kept remarkably easy. They're cut down radically on the volumes of data that is collected as a typical clinical trial would do. They had only a few questions at enrollment, and there was only one other data collection point either when the patient died or was discharged or at 28 days, which makes it easier for healthcare workers to collect the data and come up with meaningful outcomes. And when you actually look at it, the only real outcome that you're looking at is a reduction in mortality. This was not an accidental hit. This was not a fluke. It was clearly a deliberate backing by the establishment. As I showed you in the letter that was sent out to the NHS uh, physicians, it, was, it, it demonstrated the commitment of the government. That study like this is impossible to run in any other country because they lack a national health service. In a study in a country which has 90% of patients being treated under the NHS, it is very easy to do this kind of a study given the background of large studies that have previously run. The government explicitly prioritized the trial over others. They said, we have multiple arms to study in this study, so we're not going to have a large number of smaller studies coming up which actually add very little to meaningful medical literature. And the MAMS design, the multi-arm, multi-stage design, was not an accident which was suddenly developed during the COVID-19. It had been pioneered by the Medical Research Council Clinical Trials Unit in a, in, a, in a landmark trial called the Stampede Trial for Prostate Cancer, which has run for close to 20 years now and has answered some of the most important questions in prostate cancer. So when the choice came to start a completely innovative study design, they were not looking at uh, ways they could do that. They had a ready-made system in place. Uh, I'll come to the end of my talk by, coming, by listing out some of the negatives and the positives that have come out of this entire uh, saga. I've found that there's been an unholy rush to publish. There's been this intellectual gluttony which has sometimes bordered on, on, uh, on, on, on ethics. And there seems to be uh, a prioritization of personal credit coming in over global good. So I don't expect researchers worldwide to suddenly become altruistic and start working towards the global good. But when there is clear demonstration of the fact that this is a pandemic which requires extraordinary measures to, to find a solution, looking at personal credit seems quite uh, ugly. We've had newspaper releases trump preprints and uh, pardon, uh, the pun is not intended. And we've had preprints trumping uh, peer reviewed publications. Uh, some of which was useful. For example, the, the, the press release uh, from the recovery trial on, on HCQ as well as Lopinavir Ritonavir has been useful, but that these are press releases coming from respected academicians and not from uh, uh, some of the other kind of researchers that we've had, which have overstated their uh, results, some of whom have overinterpreted their data and so on. We've had a lot of substandard studies, and I use the compassionate use remdesivir and the original HCQ study as examples of uh, substandard studies being passed off as uh, evidence. But I'm an eternal optimist, and I think, uh, no, before that, 
there's this uh, ridiculous study which came out of the US, which tried to correlate uh, states uh, and the physician salary to COVID-19 mortality. So on the y-axis, you have the mortality rate from COVID-19, and on the x-axis, you have the average physician salary. And these were the, the scatter points that you see of, uh, um, of these states. And by some remarkable statistical uh, 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 methods, the, they showed a, an inverse correlation between the mortality rate and the physician salary. Uh, they were suggesting that average physician, if you, if you pay your doctors more, your mortality from COVID-19 would actually re reduce. But if you actually look at the data points, look at how they are and look at how the final curve has actually, the linear curve has, has come in. If I had to draw a curve on, on, on a uh, plot like this, I would probably do something like this. So clearly showing that there's been a lot of rubbish that's got published in the name of science in the last few weeks. But there have been plenty of positives which have come out from the pandemic uh, research as well. It clearly demonstrates that there is no substitute to collaboration and teamwork. So if you see the recovery trial, which I use as an as a example of well-conducted research, it clearly shows that you need the kind of teams that they worked in the NHS to be able to show the results that they did. The, the solidarity trial, which is uh, remarkably similar to the, the recovery trial in the trial that it also is a, a multi-arm, multi-stage disease, is similar. It also uh, evaluates several other treatment options, but it is science borders. And what they're looking at is, is several other uh, countries contributing to this. They've already uh, started in 30 countries and uh, they're planning to start in another 60 countries. And the advantage of uh, research science borders is the fact that they've been able to follow the pandemic as it went. So when the UK had the, the, the uh, recovery trial, with the falling numbers, they are finding it now difficult to recruit patients onto the remaining arms. But whereas the solidarity trial now gains from this by, by being run in several countries. And as you know, in countries where the, the, the incidence is much higher, they're able to recruit much faster. And they're currently recruiting at close to 500 patients a week, which is remarkable. We've had uh, regulatory approvals uh, rising to the occasion. They've, they've been extremely quick. Uh, they've not stood in the way of good science and they've uh, helped the ethics committees and regulatory boards getting to be far more nimble than they used to be. I already mentioned the benefits of the multi-arm, multi-stage disease, uh, multi-stage uh, way of uh, study designs, which is pretty innovative and adaptive, and it's become much more popular now, though it's actually uh, more than 20 years old. Importantly to me, uh, public awareness of medical research has improved. So though from that initial suspicion where, where patients are treated, considered as guinea pigs in, in clinical trials, the importance of uh, medical research has uh, never been as emphasized as it has been now. But to me, the biggest take home is the fact that you need a robust public health system and a research network to be able to do the kind of studies that uh, recovery did. So this is my final slide. What have we learned from this pandemic? We know now that academic research changes practice dramatically. The, the recovery trial data are enough uh, evidence of that. We know that large trials can be done quickly, yes, even in a pandemic. We know that medical research needs strong support from the establishment, and I will probably emphasize this many more times because the recovery trial was a non-starter if the UK government had not supported it the way they did, both with resources and with the kind of uh, push that they gave. The benefits of universal healthcare, which the National Health Service in the UK uh, is a clear example of, go much beyond patient care. It would probably be much more difficult to do it in a kind of uh, uh, scattered uh, healthcare delivery model that we have in countries like India or even in the US. The US has still not managed to come up with a large trial in spite of seeing hundreds of thousands of uh, patients getting COVID-19 in the US. But to me, I will end by saying, yes, even in a pandemic, there are no shortcuts to evidence-based medicine. So I'll stop with this for now and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pramesh. Um, uh, since uh, we've had a, a couple of technical difficulties, so uh, Jitu and Sandhya will be uh, uh, feeding, uh, will be uh, asking the questions and handling the Q&A. So uh, Jitu, over to you. Yeah. Um, so, so Sandhya, do you want to start? Um, I, notice, I notice you have a list. Thank you, Jitu. Um, yes, I do actually have a list and uh, <laughs> partly driven by the many webinars that uh, 
Ramesh has kept me apprised of and I've had the chance to attend. A uh, couple of questions are very India specific that I'm going to ask. Um, what about case fatality rate? Do you really think it's lower in India and Asia? And um, has the solidarity or recovery trial shown any differences in benefits based on ethnicity of patients? Right. Um, so the honest answer to uh, uh, is the case fatality rate in India uh, and other East Asian, and East Asian countries is uh, we don't know for sure. There does seem to be an indication that the case fatality rate in these countries is lower. Certainly lower in countries like uh, uh, like uh, Hong Kong in South Korea, Japan certainly, uh, China's uh, got its act together. So many of these countries have had a lower case fatality rate. Uh, I'm not so certain about it being as low as it is reported because uh, I still think testing needs to be a lot more than what it has been so far, I know the there has been a major push to uh, increase testing uh, across the country, and uh, thanks to initiatives by several government organizations, this has happened in uh, India as well. Uh, but the accuracy of death reporting has always been a problem in India and uh, continues to be so even during the pandemic. So while we have reliable data coming in from several of the uh, larger cities and metros, I'm not so sure about the reliability of the data in, in some of the smaller cities where uh, death certificates are given and some of them even without death certificates. So uh, it definitely seems to be lower than uh, several other countries, especially in Europe and, uh, uh, and the US. Uh, I'm not so sure it's as low as it is uh, uh, reported in India. And is that, this is, what about the drugs themselves? Are you going to, I mean, have there been any reports? If not in, uh the COVID example, but in other cases where you have differences based on ethnicity of the patient. Certainly. So, so there are several examples of how ethnicity matters. And I'll take my own uh, field for an, for an example. Lung cancer is a classic example. Uh, targeted therapy seems to work much better in uh, Asians rather than in Caucasians. And that's primarily because of, of, of mutation status. So those who have a, a targetable mutation uh, respond to the to the drug. And the prevalence of this targetable mutation seems to be much higher in Asian ethnicity rather than Caucasian ethnicity. So there's several examples where, why, uh, where, where uh, outcomes are different. The solidarity trial, coming back to your earlier question, neither the solidarity trial nor the recovery trial have, uh, the solidarity trial has not even reported on final outcomes. So we don't know that yet. But we know that uh, the recovery trial has reported, but uh, it has not reported as per ethnicity. So it's largely a UK-based trial. And though there are a large proportion of Asians there, uh, I don't think they've reported on uh, ethnicity-based uh, mortality rates, even with the recovery trial. But it'd be an interesting question to answer. Um, so in one of the things that was very nice about the hormone uh, replacement therapy that you talked about was how there were a large number of observational studies. And you also mentioned that with HCQ. Do you think given the problems that you highlighted in your talk for observational studies, do they have any role at all? Would they, for instance, be considered a starting point for thinking about, you know, do you start a randomized control trial? No, absolutely. So, so observational studies, so don't get me wrong. So I'm not a fanatic for randomized trials. And there are several settings where randomized trials are just uh, inappropriate. And I'll use a COVID example to say that. Mm -hmm. We know this issue of masks whether masks help in, uh, in COVID-19. So ideally, a purist would say that you need a randomized trial, half the people getting masks, half the people not getting masks, and the showing demonstrating that the half which didn't get a mask actually uh, had a lower chance of developing COVID as compared to the, one, uh, uh, the, the ones who are wearing masks have a lower incidence compared to the ones who weren't wearing masks, right? That's a, what's what a purist would say. I don't think that requires a randomized trial at all. So where you have such strong observational data and where the risk of wearing a mask is so much lower, it's not like a drug where the possibility of side effects occur. It's, we know that it's harmless. We know that millions have been wearing masks for years together. You don't need a randomized trial to do that. It's like saying that, how do you know that smoking causes lung cancer? All this was based on natural experiments, following up large cohorts of smokers, following up large cohorts of non-smokers, and coming up with fairly substantially uh, reliable evidence that 
smoking causes cancer. So not every question is uh, requires a randomized trial. And anyone who's done a randomized trial knows that it is a it's it's a pain in the neck to actually conduct. So if there is an option where uh, an observational study is possible and is reliable, I would say go for it. But with most therapeutic options where there is clinical equipoise, I don't think there is a, a, a shortcut by not doing a randomized trial. Observational studies are important. Many of these studies that have uh, later on uh, breakthroughs that we've had as uh, randomized trials have had their origins in uh, observational studies. And these are typically hypothesis generating. They are not hypothesis uh, uh, confirming. So if, if that is understood and you understand the limitations of observational studies, I think they have a lot of value. Yeah. Uh, so here's a question from Arna, whom you know very well. Um, how does the public and the press separate the rubbish from the reasonable in such times? What would be a recommendation before people report such work and governments jump to use the conclusions of such often half-baked studies? So that's that's a that's a great question, and uh, uh, so I don't think you can expect every. Uh, member of the general public to be an expert on how to interpret a clinical study. I think the responsibility lies predominantly with the researchers. And unless we exercise some uh, caution and integrity while reporting the results, ensuring that you don't overstate your conclusions, overinterpret your data, uh, I think the primary responsibility lies with, with the researcher. But we know from experience and we know in the past and we know from, uh, I'm pretty certain even in the future, researchers are all not going to be uh, untainted and it's uh, naive to expect them to uh, be uh, to report exactly what the data is which brings the next level of scrutiny at the level of the editorial board the problem here that we've had is that much of what has gone into public domain has bypassed that system so you had researchers going to the press first to the preprint next and then to the publisher which means that it's completely reversed normally you would expect the, the, the manuscript to be accepted in the journal before you go to press. Here it's been reversed. And by the time the damage con damage is controlled by a uh, peer review, it's already done. It's, it's already out in public milieu. HCQ is a classic example. It was all out in the press. Uh, the general public lapped it up. We, were, we had doctors at our own hospital. We had general public scrambling to uh, pharmacies to buy up HCQ. The ones who really needed it, like rheumatoid arthritis, didn't get the drug. And then comes the preprint, which again seems to show some promise, which is again not peer review. And finally, the publication, which again the editors of that particular uh, paper were severely conflicted. So this seems to have passed through every level of uh, filtration as far as the integrity and the reliability of the data is concerned. And this is an unfortunate consequence of, of this greed for to publish. And, and, and I don't think there's an easy answer to that, Arnab other than uh, uh, more responsible reporting by researchers, more responsible peer review uh, of journals uh, by the journal reviewers, and again, uh, responsible reporting by the, the, the lay media as well. So that's another level of, uh, because that's the uh, media through which the public gets uh, aware of, uh, uh, of, of uh, medical results. And I think uh, increasing awareness and education amongst the journalists, and I'm pretty happy with the way Indian journalists have reported uh, the, during the COVID pandemic, they've been fairly responsible. They picked up this, the flaws with the HCQ study. They picked up the flaws with the Remdesivir study and more recently with the Favipiravir. So they've been fairly responsible in reporting. But unfortunately, uh, a lot of hype gets uh, disseminated amongst the public before uh, the damage is connected. Yeah. Uh, uh, let Sandhya? me take one. Yeah. yeah. I'll just, let um, me just send one question and then just... turn it over to you. No, no, no. Can I just get in one point right now and then uh, get back to you? The, you know, several of the questions, um, uh, Pramesh, have been uh, looking at vaccines and asking, you know, what are the, you know, what, what are the, you know, the uh, consequences of the, the kind, exactly the kind of um, situational uh, or lack of evidence-based uh, um, medicine that you are worried about. Uh, getting itself embroiled in this whole business of producing a vaccine and uh, making making them available. So several of the questions were concerned about this. And I was wondering whether you have something to say. 
Right. So I think um, given the data that we now have about uh, antibodies and uh, the clearly disappointing results of the prevalence, it looks like it will take a vaccine to create immunity and probably from a long-term perspective, that seems the uh, most likely solution to this. We're not seeing dramatic uh, uh, breakthroughs in treatment, so which makes us rely on vaccines more often and hopefully something should come. But having said that, uh, I think there's, again, uh, a reality check as far as the pros due process goes in developing a vaccine. It goes through several phases, initially animal studies, then even in human studies, it goes through phase one, phase two, and phase three. And again, there cannot be an unholy rush in getting the vaccine out into the market. The earliest that I anticipate uh, a vaccine coming out into the market would be early next year, and I'm probably being super optimistic in that uh, assessment. Just for context, the fastest uh, previous vaccine that was developed uh, took five years. So by uh, even attempting something in a few months is being very ambitious. I know medical science has progressed a lot since then, but uh, we would be naive in expecting uh, a, a vaccine very soon. And again, there is no 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 way we can get away from due process here. Uh, because here you're, you're actually injecting normal, healthy individuals. Their right. safety is an issue, uh, the reliability, and the moment you get a vaccine, you get lulled into this false sense of security that you're immune. And if it's not efficacious, then then you're actually uh, letting yourself and the community in for, for a much bigger pandemic than what we have, have currently. Right. I, I, I guess, you know, I mean, the, the, the flip side of that is what, what should be the, the responsibility of, you know, the establishment as well as the agencies that regulate uh, such, uh, such work in in educating the public in the first place, and then in making, you know, as we've heard, say various pronouncements. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it would be, you know, important for us to hear from, you know, somebody in your in your position. Right. Uh, I think in this particular uh, issue, the public's not been the one which has uh, uh, hankered over a vaccine. Uh, we've had uh, several people uh, hyping the 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 promise of a vaccine and the rapidity with which uh, it would come uh, become available for general use uh, so uh, i think a huge amount of education needs to go a reality check needs to go and with most people even uh, lay people that i have spoken to they seem to understand that the process of developing a vaccine is a fairly long affair and to expect something fairly soon is is, is uh, uh, not realistic. And even if you look at uh, social media, uh, if you look at Twitter, most people seem to understand that uh, a vaccine is not coming here uh, quickly. Right. Uh, so, so the other question is, you know, I think, you know, it's worth speaking about how you connected the the sort of collaboration between the government the uh, academic research and clinical clinical uh, research in generating something of great value in the recovery trial now the policies again from that perspective need to be multiply informed and uh, could could you comment a little bit on the uh, icmr's policy that's one of the questions that's being raised on the icmr's policy on the use of all the drugs that have been mentioned today, uh, and whether that uh, you know that needs some input again from uh, more more considered view, of, uh, you know, considered uh, studies. Right. Uh, so, I think the ICMR was in a particularly difficult situation when the pandemic started, because we had very little information about the virus. We had very little information about what works and what doesn't. And uh, in a situation like this, when there is mass panic amongst the uh, general public, uh, the, the rate of spread is fairly large. Sometimes you do need to take and make decisions uh, based on sketchy data. And that's something that most organizations have had to live with, have had to learn to do, including the WHO, which made several decisions which they subsequently reversed. And I think that's fair. That's part of how science grows. Uh, and uh, so long as you're clear in, the, in your knowledge that you are making this decision without uh, strong data to support it and be open to the idea of reversing it as and when new data comes in. I think that's something that uh, whether we like it or not, uh, we need to do. Uh, so what I described uh, now is, uh, uh, is, is probably a fairly comprehensive review of all the drugs that we know work or don't work in, in uh, uh, COVID-19. We know that dexamethasone works in moderately ill to severely ill. It doesn't work in the early stage of the disease. 
we know that remdesivir works to some extent uh, probably uh, not, we've not seen a mortality reduction yet but we still know that it's a faster viral clearance which is a reasonably good uh, outcome as well if you're able to get more people cleared of the virus quickly you are uh, relieving healthcare resources for those who need it more so we know that uh, remdesivir works in uh, the earlier stages of the disease but there's very little data to support uh, any of the other recommendations that are being made by any organization uh, so far uh, we know that in clinical practice several other treatments are being used tocilizumab is one uh, and people still use hcq in spite of the uh, uh, the negative data supporting it and that's that's been a particular problem here so it's no longer becoming a, a discussion a healthy discussion on uh, data or science it's uh, degenerated very often into beliefs more often than on data and hcq is a classic example so the, when the negative hcq data started coming in the hcq uh, supporters started uh, saying that the dose was wrong and when the dose was right they said they didn't add uh, vitamin c or zinc and when that was done they said they should have added azithromycin they should have added it a little early i mean you can always find faults with any kind of study but uh, it's it's this openness to uh, to being pr proven wrong yourself in something that you believe in strongly that that marks not only a good researcher it's it's crucial for a researcher but even more important for a clinician if he or she needs to provide uh, optimum patient care for their uh, for their respective patients it's this uh, ambivalence uh, which probably doctors are unable to deal with so most often you have data to support the decision you're taking and when you don't have the data you're not comfortable being uncertain and that's something which i think is uh, extremely important uh, both for researchers as well as as for clinicians that's a very important important point uh... Uh, Pramesh, uh, I mean, I I think uh, maybe we we probably getting to the end of uh, the uh, the question and answer session, but a couple, uh, just a couple more questions. One, uh, one, you know, how, how uh, sort of compelled are hospitals uh, to publish data on the trials that they are that they are executing at the moment? And if they are compelled, can there not be a you know, some kind of a serious registry that uh, picks up information from all these different trials and, and connect them post facto. So, so that was one of the questions that was asked. And um, I guess in some ways, trying to construct a recovery trial post facto rather than, you know, rather than, you know, from a large network that is already set up. So I don't, I don't know uh, whether there is an effort such as, that, such as sort of a distributed network that can function like that. I think that's the question that is being asked. Right. Uh, so, 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 what was your first question? The first part of your question. I remember the second it was, part. It was about the about the sort of clinical trials that are going on in variety of places. Oh, yes. the, the, the hospitals being compelled to. Uh, yeah, there is. I mean, as in any field uh, of research, there is this publish or perish mentality, uh, both amongst uh, uh, researchers as well as uh, uh, hospitals. So the reputation of a hospital or a researcher or a clinician is more the more they publish. And unfortunately, that's become a way of life uh, for us. It's become your, your gateway to promotions, academic progress, and so on. And unfortunately, quantity seems to uh, have taken precedence over quality. The number of publications, your impact factor, your H index seem to become the magic numbers based on which career progression and your reputation depends upon. To me, a good recovery trial, I would trade being a PI on a recovery trial to every single publication that I have today. So I'd be happy with that one publication. But unfortunately, we've allowed, uh, we've allowed uh, 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 quality to suffer at the, the cost of quantity. Coming to the uh, distributed uh, way of doing it, so this can be done, and typically these are done as meta-analysis of uh, uh, other trials, and this is a well-known uh, thing in medical literature. Uh, unfortunately, a post-facto co combining of uh, much of the trials, uh, though it is done frequently in meta-analysis, is not uh, as good as doing a single large well-conducted trial. And primarily, that's, that's because there's a lot of heterogeneity between the trials, and you're often not able to adjust for that heterogeneity. Uh, so uh, a, a large, well-conducted randomized trial is probably the highest level of evidence and, and the meta-analysis of smaller randomized trials would be the next level of, of the evidence. But that's, that's, that's certainly better than uh, the, the just isolated uh, events. But what I think the pandemic has taught us is, is the power of large pragmatic trials. And that's the beauty of 
several of these trials. So we are, we are currently running a 10,000 patient study uh, along with the MRC UK on, on, use, on repurposing aspirin for four common cancers uh, in, in the UK and in India. And those are the kind of studies which you know are large, they're pragmatic, they're open. And if those results come positive, you know that they're really generalizable. So I wouldn't trade uh, a slew of smaller studies uh, subsequently getting post, uh, uh, post hoc combined into a larger study for, for a, uh, if you have the opportunity to do so, a large, a single uh, study. Right. I mean, in, in some ways, you're, you're also commenting on the surgy sphere kind of method of an, uh, of, of um, collecting data, right? Which which effectively amounts to looking at small small efforts by variety of different hospitals, and then right. coming up with some grand picture on based on that, right? Right. I mean, uh, so, but the, I, I'll just take a bit of uh, uh, explaining of that. So, I think uh, data like what comes out of surgery sphere is great. It's real world data. You know what's happening in the in, in 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 general hospitals and so on. But I'd be a little skeptical about using that to change practice, and that's primarily because. Uh, a lot of the biases that occur in routine uh, practice are not eliminated uh, as, as but just because you have a large data set. The strength of real world data is that you're able to accumulate huge amounts of data, but the quality of the data, even with such a large number of patients being involved, included in it, is not as good as a much smaller, well-conducted randomized trial. And that's primarily because you're not able to adjust for bias. So uh, just as in the Henry Ford study, which is a fairly large study, it's over a thousand, two thousand patient study, but the biases that were involved, the older patients didn't get uh, 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 HCQ, the younger patients got it. And this is clearly a prognostic factor which impacts. So how do you tease these out from large data sets? Right, absolutely, yeah. And, and um, finally, I think just on, you know, given the positive uh, uh, spin uh, that you portrayed of the, of the pandemic, uh, which I think is really in, in something that all of us have been seeing in terms of people coming together and getting uh, getting to work uh, across disciplines, across uh, uh, various kinds of um, you know divides that are, that exist today. Uh, the the promise that you know this this study that dexamethasone uh, brought about, and also the transparency that it, that it uh, was executed under, really bodes very well uh, for the future. Uh, what, one of our um, listeners had a had a very small question. I think, in, in what is this open seal, <laughs> uh, and why is it negative? Why is it there something negative about it uh, in that in that dexamethasone study? The uh, open label. The open label. Sorry. The open, open label. label. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's that's uh, actually a good question. So, um, in the ideal study is uh, a study which is placebo controlled and double blind. By this, I mean that uh, you randomize patients to two arms. One gets the dexamethasone, the other gets a placebo. Uh, neither the patient nor the physician knows what the drug is. It's all coded. They, are, they look remarkably similar. They go to the extent of creating this very similar side effects because of the uh, drug. So it's virtually impossible to differentiate who's getting the actual drug and who's getting the placebo drug. And this is a double blind study which is the highest level of evidence. So it clearly eliminates bias even in the minds of the physician. So if I strongly believe that dexamethasone works, I might classify a pneumonia in a patient who got dexamethasone as a mild pneumonia. Whereas if I knew that the patient got it in a, uh, got the placebo, I would classify it as a, as a uh, moderate pneumonia. And this can skew results. By doing a double blind placebo control study or eliminating that. In an open label study, you don't even try to create a blind, which means that you, the, both the physician as well as the patient knows that this is the drug that they're getting, which can to some extent uh, bias the results. But uh, I guess when you have to start trials in nine days, it takes a lot of time to create placebos which are exactly looking the same, smelling the same, sounding the same, everything. And uh, uh, the researchers in a pandemic situation don't have the luxury of being able to create the placebo in time to do this. It is also particularly difficult in a multi-arm study because you'll have to have multiple dummies. So you'll actually have to give everyone five drugs in a five-arm study, each of which looks the same, and it gets extremely messy and complicated. So, so, so in a multi-arm study, it's next to impossible to do, but even in a two-arm study, uh, it's difficult. But if you have the opportunity to do so, I would, I would strongly recommend those who are uh, embarking on a research career to do it because there's substantial evidence that there is huge overestimation in open-label studies as compared to blinded studies. 
there's some fascinating examples in multiple sclerosis and uh, several other examples I could give you give about that. And and Jitu, I'm just going to end with this last question. Even if you don't, if you if you don't have a question, it's great that you brought on this point of collaboration. So for those of you, uh, uh, so uh, so I didn't know Jitu six months back. I didn't know Arnab six months back. And we are now working. Though we all belong to the same uh, Department of Atomic Energy under the Government of India, and currently, and I didn't know Sandhya uh, six months back. And now we are all sitting here, not just being part of this webinar. I'm, we are working on a, a pooling study with uh, Jitu's group at uh, NCBS. We are working with Sandhya on the COVID GAN side. We are working with Arnab on how we can decontaminate N95 masks and how we will assess the quality of a mask. So it's it's great. I mean, the pandemic has brought a lot of good things in addition to all the the bad things that we have seen. So absolutely, uh, but I but I would have traded the pandemic and tried to have met up and worked with you otherwise anyway. <laughs> But it's been very, very wonderful to have uh, known you. And I think Sandhya wants to uh, wrap up uh, with uh, a few words from her side. Yeah. Thank you, Pramesh. That was really, really fantastic. I thoroughly enjoyed myself. And uh, indeed, I remember when I got the first phone call from you and I had just sort of started with COVID Gyan. And, and it's been a really remarkable journey to um, in both in this webinar and to sort of see the TMC webinars, which also I will advertise since um, Dr. Pramesh they are amazing places. And I think in this show, in those webinars, I've heard Kagandeep Kang five times and Saumya Swaminathan some four times. So really cutting edge people come there and sort of tell the, um, uh, you know, what's going on. And, and Dr. Pramesh has done an amazing job of sharing the general area of clinical trials. I thank you very much that you took this time in this very busy schedule of yours to come and speak to us. Thank you. Thank you.